know you're packing digital goodies out there. Please take a moment to make them quiet before we do. Please silence all electronic devices. Good morning, everyone. Hasn't this been a fabulous week? You know, it's our, our goal and our desire that this week that you have experienced a new fusion of teaching, learning, and technology, and that you have gathered new resources, new ideas, and best practices that you'll take back to your schools, to your districts, and share with your colleagues to make a fabulous, lasting impact on your students. According to our bylaws, each year a membership business meeting is called. We elect to hold this meeting during convention. As president of TCEA and having established a quorum present, 
I call this meeting to order. Please welcome Vice President of Records and Finance, David Jacobson, to give a business report. You all were a lot more excited when I used to give away door prizes. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the finance report. Thanks to the talented and hardworking TCA staff, the, the dedicated board of directors and SIG officers, partners and sponsors, our over 14,000 members, and the schools, districts, and organizations for which they work, I am very pleased to tell you that TCA is in a strong financial position. TCA has a $3 million budget with $1.6 million additional dollars set aside in investments. Our investments continue to show slow but steady growth. Once again, our revenues exceeded expectations and our expenses are below budget. We have outgrown our current building in Austin and we are looking for a new home to provide expanded services to our members. So if any of you have a few extra million dollars lying around and would like to purchase a lovely Austin office building, please let us know. Remember that every one of you registered for convention are now members of TCEA. We hope you take full advantage of your membership and all the benefits and opportunities it provides. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now it is my honor to introduce to you the TCEA Board of Directors. These men and women give unselfishly of their time and energy to serve this organization. We thank them for their commitment, and we also thank their families and their school districts for giving them the opportunity to champion their passions. Members of our board of directors are past president, Lee Sleeper, <laughs> president, Dr. Carla Burkholder, president-elect, Carrie Murphy, Vice President-Elect Merrick Threadgill, Vice President Records and Finance David Jacobson, Vice President Member Services Cindy Galt, Area 1 Director Dr. Patricia Abrego, Area 2 Director Holly Horton, Area 3 Director David Luna, Area 4 Director Tom Brawley, Area 5 Director Susie Brooks, Area 6 Director, Ronnie Gonzalez. Area 7 Director, Scott Floyd. Area 8 Director, David Phillips. Area 9 Director, Don Sewell. Area 10 Director, Cheryl McDonald. Area 11 Director, Dwight Goodwin. Area 12 Director, Luann Hughes. Area 13 Director, Bill Lewis. Area 14 Director, Christy Kate. Area 15 Director, Sandy Sawyer. Area 16 Director, Debbie Boyer. <laughs> Area 17 Director, Dr. Kathy Morton. Area 18 Director, Debbie Dobbs. Area 19 Director, Brian Grenier. Area 20 Director, Roland Rios. Please join me in recognizing their contributions to TCEA. <laughs> Area directors ser serve a term of two years, as do the Vice President of Records and Finance and Vice President Member Services. The terms alternate during the election cycle. The VP-elect convention and the President-elect are elected each year. In October of 2012, Elections were held, and beginning April 1st, the following changes in board seats will occur. Past President, Dr. Carla Burkholder. President, Carrie Murphy. President-elect, Candace Threadgill. Vice President Convention, Merritt Threadgill. Vice President-elect Convention, Bill Lewis. And Area 13 Director, Brian Doyle. We look forward to serving with you another year. At this time, I'd like to thank today's session sponsor, ISTE. 
Now many of you are familiar with ISTE. You know ISTE because of the conference that they have every year. Many of you get to go. But you might not be familiar with many of the member services that they have. For me, the last three years, a great benefit came from my membership in ISTE through the research that they provide through the Journal of Research and Technology and Education. This has, has uh, been with me throughout my doctoral journey and I appreciate that benefit from ISTE. So at this time, I would ask you to welcome to the podium Susan Larson, Director of Volunteer Leadership. Thank you so much. We have had such a good week being here with you, um, learning, seeing what you're doing, watching this conference just absolutely explode. And we're thrilled to be sponsoring this event and getting, getting a, two minutes just to say hello to you um, today. Um, we, ISTE has had a long time um, really good partnership with TCA as one of our affiliates and I have to say that we have about almost 80 affiliates around the world. Um, not all of them are exactly like TCA and I really like to show you guys off and I have to say that um, uh, as we learn together I am not exaggerating. Every time we do something with TCA and we work together, even just chatting or working on projects or coming up with the ideas, I'm constantly telling Lori and your board, boy I always learn from you and she says, oh no, no, we learn from you. You know what? That's exactly the point. So I'm just really proud to, to have that partnership with you. Um, so, so a lot of you are familiar with ISTE, some of you aren't. How many of you already are ISTE members? I saw like five hands who aren't, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about ISTE, which actually is the International Society for Technology and Education. So we do a lot of the same things you do, um, not just of course here in Texas, not even just here in the United States, but around the world, and we we'll try very hard to bring together those experts, those thought leaders, those people just like you that are, that are really making change happen and coming up with ideas and, and network us all together, and we do that through a lot of things. Um, really work hard with advocacy. Again, another thing that I, I often point to with TCA about your work and, and how you influence those policymakers, which I've seen happen at the conference this week. Hopefully all of you had a chance to go send your letters off, which was very impressive. Very good job for that. Um, we are the home of the NET standards, and I know a lot of you are very familiar with that and are using that in your classrooms and your districts. Um, do a lot of professional development in countless ways, constantly trying to um, help all of you and, and, and use your expertise to share and help other people learn. Um, a lot of research that Carla mentioned, books, magazines, webinars, all kinds of things. Everything that we can do to network you together, those who are experts, those who are just learning, and everybody in between to really make those differences. Um, we also kind of do this little event every year, kind of in June. I don't know, we kind of throw it together at the last minute, just kidding. How many of you have been to an ISTE conference before? Yes. And how many of you are already going to be going to San Antonio in just a few weeks, or a few months? Okay, we definitely want to invite you to just, you know, hop on down the road and join us. We're very excited to partner with TCA to put on this event this year. and. Um, your expertise and your involvement is, is very important in that. And we definitely want to invite you, and not just you, but those people back at your school and your district who haven't been yet, and you're thinking, this is the time, this is the year, because it's right here in our own backyard. Um, just a little bit about the conference. It, it is pretty nonstop. It's pretty overwhelming. There's more to, to, that you could do that you ever have time for. So um, buddy up and make a plan about how you're going to sort of divide and conquer and have a great week there. Um, hundreds and hundreds of sessions, hands-on, playgrounds, lectures, lounges. It, it's, it's pretty nonstop, and we, we hope that you join us. Um, a couple of things that are really important for you as TCA members, um, because of the partnership that we do have with TCA, you get a special, um, the, a special discounted rate on the conference longer than the other people out there. So be sure when you register to indicate that you're a TCA member so that you get that discount. Um, another great thing is you can be involved with the conference even more by being a volunteer. And um, it's a lot of you are volunteers at this conference. You can do that at our ISTE conference as well. Get more involved, um, get on the inside scoop, share your energy um, with all the attendees there. So we invite you to join us in June. And thanks again for having us. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, ISTE, for sponsoring today's session. For the first time in history, 
Four generations are working shoulder to shoulder. Traditionalists, baby boomers, generation Xers, and millennials. Unfortunately, generational differences can get in the way of everything from recruiting, to retention, to communication, which can have a dramatic effect on the bottom line. Our presenter today, Seth Madison, works with a company called BridgeWorks, which is dedicated to speaking and consulting on generational issues for organizations ranging from the IRS to AARP to MTV. For over a decade, they have been called on by business executives, politicians, and the media to share expertise on how best to bridge generational gaps. BridgeWorks partnered with the Institute for Corporate Productivity to conduct a national survey that reveals millennials' workplace attitudes and behaviors and compares them to those of traditionalists, baby boomers, and generation Xers. This cutting edge research is highlighted in their 2010 book, The M Factor, how the millennial generation is rocking the workplace, which spotlights the seven trends that shape the millennials and that will reshape the workplace. Seth is a generational junkie, a texter, a tweeter, a blogger, a speaker, a millennial, and a deep thinker about generational issues. He tells us we have nothing to fear from his generation and much to look forward to. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear what he has to say. Please welcome Seth Madison, expert on the millennial generation. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I am so incredibly excited to finally be here with you all. I actually, I actually got in on Wednesday and have been here for a majority of the conference, which doesn't get to happen very often with my travel schedule where I'm able to come in early for a conference, but with this one, uh, the, the week was open and I've just been so interested and so fascinated with the world that you are all trying to navigate that I, um, I decided to come in early and caught some great sessions. On Wednesday, I had a chance to see um, Peter Sheehan speak. How many of you got to see Peter speak? Awesome, right? Awesome. I said to him, I'm like, I'm so glad somebody else is up here speaking who looks younger than me because I've been getting so much grief for such a long time. People are always like, you know, dude, you're the speaker. You're going to talk to us about the generations. You're like the same age as my kid. What, what are you going to say? And, and what I always say to those people is, I, I, you have to understand, I was literally born to do this. I was born on a, a fourth generation farm in southern Minnesota. Yeah, got some farm kids here. And I, I grew up working alongside my great grandfather, my grandfather, and my father. And, and I learned from a very early age how to sell three other generations on getting out of doing chores. <laughs> and I was good at it. As you can tell, I'm not a farmer today. No, but my whole world was a multi-generational world. And, and I learned and I understood how to adapt my approach in order to connect with each one of these generations. And then I had the unbelievable opportunity to partner with two giants in the generation space almost five years ago now, David Stillman and Lynn Lancaster. And over this period of time, we've had a chance to work with 25 of the top Fortune 100 companies in the world in every single industry, in every single sector, to understand how these generational dynamics are playing out. Now, as you can imagine, with Lynn's a baby boomer, David's a Gen Xer, I'm, I, I'm a millennial, we have had our fair share of generational moments when working together. And uh, I want to share a, a quick one that recently happened between David and I. But let, let me ask you, how many of you have ever been made to feel a little bit older than you'd like to admit? I see some hands. You may feel a little bit older than you'd like to admit. Those of you who aren't raising your hands are lying. We've all been there, so I think you're going to be able to relate to this story. So, so David and I are traveling recently. We're, we're in St. Louis, and David has a challenge maybe some of you have. He is navigationally impaired. Now, he's a person who's always lost. And so whenever we travel together, I end up having to drive, or we've got to get a car. 
But on this trip, I've got a conference call. I can't drive. There's no car lined up. David's got to drive. And of course, 15 minutes outside of the airport, we are already late and lost. Just, it's typical. And we're doing a same day travel with some media. And so the, the meeting planner is frantically calling, like, where are you guys? You're on in like two hours. And we're trying to calm her down, like, we're almost there, we're almost there, don't worry. We have no idea where we are, we're not close. But we pull up to a set of stoplights, and next to us pulls up a car full of high school millennial girls, teenage girls. You know, you know these girls. And th the first thing, David, David looks over, he sees them, he gets all excited because he's thinking, now they're teenagers, they're, they're probably local, they'll probably know where we need to go, they can give us some directions. So the, the first thing he does, which he hates that I tell people this, but he totally grabs a rear view mirror, checks to make sure that his hair looks cool. And he looks over, he gets their attention in the window and he goes like this. Some of you know where this is going. <laughs> These girls stare back at him with that deer in the headlights face, like, who is this weirdo? And are quickly like, look away, look away, look away, look away. Don't look at this guy, don't look at this guy, you know? It's a creep. Now, I'm on my phone over here and I'm watching this play out. And I know exactly what is going on. Because David gets all frustrated. He's like, ah, oh, who raised these kids? I can't believe how rude. He's, he's clueless. But I know what's going on. And, and I know that I could save David in this moment. <laughs> but I choose not to. How many of you have been in that position where you're watching a colleague or a friend feeling very frustrated with a piece of technology? You could jump in and save him, but you don't. That's what I'm doing. But I think it's going to register in his head because he goes to get their attention again. But what does David do this time? He, he just does it bigger. So now it's just like this <laughs> in the window before the light turns green. And we're going to miss our chance. And, and, and the little 14-year-old in the back seat, in, in the way that a, only a 14-year-old girl can do with so much attitude, leans forward and she's like, losers. <laughs> so I, I've had enough of this. I reach across David. I go like this and I simply do this. And what do you think happens? <laughs> Those windows go right down. And in that moment, as David realizes, these girls have never been in an automobile that has a physical roll-down window in it. And that wave of pain just washed over him. It's painful. You know, the, now, fortunately, we, we can laugh about these generational gaps when they happen on the personal front, in our personal lives. But when those gaps show up between you and your colleagues, between you and your students, it's not funny. It's, it's painful and it's disruptive. Now, I think this, this generation's topic is so perfect and so well suited for this conference and the conversations that you have been having today. The technology conversation. Because the reality is, is unbelievable. And I was here, I walked the trade show floors, I saw all of this new stuff. And it's unbelievable, game changing. But it is not possible for you to go back and implement and pull off these new solutions on your own. Yes or no? No, you can't do it on your own. It's going to take everyone together. It's going to take being able to connect and convince your fellow teachers, the administration, the district. Everyone has to be able to come together. And the reality is those people now are made up of three and sometimes even four generations each with their own ideas and expectations of how they want to be communicated with and how they view and look at things like change and technology. But in order to do this, in order to do it together, we've got to get past the superficial, surface level stereotypes about the generations. We've got to step back, we've got to dig deeper, we've got to find out who are these generations, what shape them, what do they value, what's important to them. And know that when we come together, we can do some unbelievable things together. And we can even have a little bit of fun along the way, like the two generations do so well in this next vintage clip. Stuart, can I see you in my office, please? That kid is sick. That hand is very sick. Stuart, get in here. Sure thing, Mr. Pink. 
Stuart, I just opened my Ameritrade account. Let's light this candle. Let's go to Ameritrade.com. It's easier than falling in love. What do you feel like buying today, Mr. P? Kmart. So research it. All this stuff is provided for you free of charge. No cost. Yeah, that's synonymous with free. Looks like a good stock. Let's buy. Let's buy 100 shares. All right, click it in there. Okay. How about 500? 100, Stuart. Ah, you feel the excitement? You're about to buy a stock okay. online. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> I'm thrilled. What did that cost me? Eight dollars, my Eight man. Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Riding the wave of the future, my man. <laughs> I gotta Listen, get some soda. All right. I'm sorry, Mr. Wait, P. I'm having a party on Saturday night if you really want to go. I'm going to try and get there. Happy Thank you, trading. Stuart. Thank you. Rock on. All right, Stuart. Yes, rock on. We can give it up for that one. Love seeing the generations come together like that. All right, so before we dive into a couple of these key trends of how do we come together, communicate, collaborate, and work well together to get these new technologies implemented, I just want to first ground us in who are these generations. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here because I'm sure many of you have seen this, you've heard a program, you've seen it in the media, but one of the ways we define a generation is by age, by birth years. And so when we look at the breakdown, we first have what we call our traditionalist generation born prior to 1946 population size of 75 million. Following our traditionalists, we've got that great big baby boomer generation, baby boomers, born from 1946 to 1964, population size 80 million. Following our boomers, we've got a smaller generation, Generation X. Uh, yeah! Xers born from 1965 to 1979, population size 60 million, a little dip there, contraction in the population. And then last but not least, we have the Millennials, also known as yeah, Gen Y. You've probably seen a whole host of names or read about us in the media. have been given a lot of names. Born from 1980 to 1995 with a population size of, of 80 million. So you kind of see that big boom after World War II. We get a little contraction in the population with Generation Xers. We saw, this is because we saw women entering the workplace record numbers. We also saw birth control hit the marketplace. So families got a bit smaller. And then the children of the baby boomers show up uh, with the millennials. Now, I always like to get a little feel for who's in the room, which again, it's like we're all kind of gravitating towards this side. I want to move. These people are lonely over here. This, I got to make sure I'm including you. Oh, I want to celebrate the generations. That's what we're here for today. And so we're going to celebrate you. So if you're willing to admit it, if you want to bump down a generation, that's absolutely fine. Just don't be calling each other out. But I want to celebrate. If, if we have any traditionalists, will you please stand up so that we can honor you? Do we have any traditionalists? Will you please stand up? Can we give it up for this generation? All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Baby boomers. Where are my baby boomers at? Baby boomers, stand up and celebrate yourselves. Hey, -o. Wow, what a group of boomers. Now look, you will never ever see a boomer group that is not excited to stand up and celebrate for themselves. Boomers stand up and it's like, yes! Generation X, where are my Xers? Xers, stand up and celebrate yourselves. Holy smokes! We've got a great group of Xers in this room. Xers, I have to tell you, maybe just because there's so many of you, well, this is a nice room of boomers, but usually when I have Xers stand up, boomers are like, whatever for the Xers. It's like you, you can't, the whole room just like goes down two octaves. Millennials, Gen Y, where are my fellow millennials at? Ayo. Nice. Nice. It's fun to have some of you in the audience. So many of my, especially leadership type sessions, I'll ask for my millennials and it's, it's me and the waiters in the back of the room are like, hey, you're not by yourself. Does anybody feel like maybe they sit in between two generations? Maybe you're not exactly a boomer, not exactly an Xer or an Xer millennial. Can I see your, your hands again? Wow, there's quite a few of you. So I ask that because I really want to acknowledge you. You are what we call a cusper. You're a cusper. And it's important we call it out because so often in our research what we have found is cuspers end up feeling a little bit invisible in this whole generations conversation. You know, it's like, I, I can't totally relate to the big events that happen to baby boomers, and I, I don't really feel like a Gen Xer or an Xer millennial. You're kind of in between. It's like, yeah, this doesn't apply to me. But what we also find is that cuspers are often 
the great translators and the great communicators inside of organizations. You are generationally bilingual, so to speak. Cuspers are the ones that are like, you go over to Mary and you're like, Mary, I know you are you're so frustrated with Carol right now, but this is what Carol meant when she said that. Then you go to Carol and you say, Carol, I know you're, ooh, you're so mad at Mary, but this is really what she meant when she said that. Uh-huh. You cuspers, you have been there. You play that role. And so for those of us that live in the heart of a generation, we want to emulate Cusper's ability to be almost generationally bilingual, see the world through their lens. It's a nice nod to our Cuspers in the room. Now, age is just a starting place. In order to understand the generations, we've got to go beyond that. We've got to look at the events and conditions that have taken place during each generation's formative years. Our formative years are those pre-teen, teen years. This is the time that you have these students in your classrooms. It's during this period in our, in our development when we're coming to terms with the world around us. You know this. We're, we're setting our beliefs on everything from communication, leadership, religion, politics, relationships. It's being formed then, which is partially why you play such a critical role in shaping people during those formative years. And so basically what we are is history buffs. Do I have any history teachers in here? Where are my history teachers? I love history. That's, that's basically what we do, the historical events for those generations. And what does that mean then as we age and get older? And some people say, well, as we get older, don't we just really become more of the same? No, absolutely not. Those key events in our formative years shape us, and we carry that with us throughout our entire life. They're so key. And so when we think about, just take a quick a little jog down history lane with our generations. With our traditionalist generation, born prior to 1946, and this is where I need a little bit of participation. What, if you think about it, what were some of the big events, big influences for this generation? What were they? Just shout them out. I hear World War II, absolutely. What else? The Great Depression. Okay, so two major ones right off the bat. World War II and the Great Depression, which for that generation, if you think about how did that impact them, how did that shape them, it created this whole mentality of, of self-sacrifice of willingness to set aside your own individual needs for the greater good. And that greater good might be the family, the community, the country as a whole. This is a generation that grew up in a time and a place where duty, honor, and country came first and foremost. Yes, and let's give it up for our traditionalist generation. An incredible legacy, incredible builders fueled the economic boom through the 50s and 60s that launched us through the 20th century. And their legacy lives on in many of our institutions. And, and we still have traditionalists, like we do in this room, that are still playing a value, valuable role. And so we still find value in acknowledging and honoring this group. Resulting traits, you have a very loyal, patriotic, fiscally conservative generation. Fiercely loyal, loyal to employers, loyal to brands. I mean, how many of you grew up in maybe either a Ford family or a Chevy family? Uh-huh. Where are my Ford families? Hey, yo. And then where are my Chevy families? And aren't those Ford families weirdos? Yeah. Uh, for me, it was more, I grew up on a, a farming community. For me, it was all of, any, any other farming communities? Okay, so for me, it was like, from my grandfather, it was John Deere and Case International. I'm from Minnesota. It was like, we were a Case International family. I couldn't even hardly be friends with the John Deere kids. <laughs> my grandfather, powerful legacy, long history. Now, transitioning to our baby boomer generation. Where are my baby boomers at? Hey, oh, what an awesome generation, big generation. Now, first being influenced by just the explosion of the population, 80 million. There's a baby boomer born every 18 seconds for almost 20 years. That's a lot of boomers. Now, think about this generation. First generation of kids to grow up with television. First generation of kids with television. For you baby boomers, what were some of your favorite early TV shows? Like, you can't miss it, you had to be there. Leave it to Beaver. I love Lucy. G Captain Kangaroo, Gilligan's Island, The Ed Sullivan Show. 
I mean, g gun smoke. Now, let's be honest. You pretty much watched whatever your old man, your dad wanted to watch, correct? Whatever dad watched went. How many of you were your dad's antenna and his remote control? Let me see your hand. <laughs> you pretty much lived next to the TV. Oh my gosh, I had a boomer come up to me a couple of weeks ago and he was like, you know, that was his, his life. And he's like, he's on the couch, he's got a, he's him and his 10 year old son are watching TV. His 10 year old gets up and goes to the kitchen. He's like, you know, Jay, will you grab me a water? And Jay's like, Ugh, you know, huffing and puffing. He's like, I mean, why are you giving me so much attitude? Like, just get your old man a, a water. You know, when I was your age, I had to stand next to the TV and change the channels for my dad. He looks him dead square in the face and he's like, why would they make a TV without a remote? <laughs> Serious. The TV, why would it not have a remote control? Unbelievable time to be a kid growing up. TV, but then, now as we age, let's think about their formative years. And with baby boomers, we kind of think about them in two groups. Those born from 1946 to 19, roughly 55, their formative years are really the, more the 60s. And those born from 56 to 64, more the 70s, right? And so what happened for those early boomers? What were some of the big influencing events in the 1960s? What was happening? Give me something. Bay of Pigs, Vietnam. The Beatles and rock and roll, absolutely, explosion of pop culture. What's that? Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights, voters' rights, human rights, women's rights. So many of the civil liberties that we enjoy today that are very easy for us as the younger generation to take for granted, those early baby boomers fought hard for. Think of the assassination of JFK and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They, they were in the streets fighting for that change fighting to change the world, seeing us launch and put a man on the moon. Now, they're influenced by that, of this mindset of idealism and optimism resulting from that. We can change the world. We can go out and make an impact. Now, younger boomers saw that play out on TV. Older boomers are in the streets, younger boomers see it on TV. Younger boomers now come of age in the 1970s. And what happens in the 1970s? History lesson. What happens with our economy? Horrible. What happens with inflation? Through the roof. Gas prices. Oil embargo. How many of you had that awesome monster car, muscle car that you waited for hours around the block to get gas? 13 miles to the gallon. But man, did you look cool doing it. Yes. Manufacturing. Jobs go overseas. Globalization takes place. And there becomes this mindset of not enough to go around. You know, lack. There's not enough coupled with the fact that you have 80 million. You have to stop and think about the implications of that. Every life stage that boomers entered, they blew, it, they blew up that life stage. They entered the school system, blew it up. Not enough desks, not enough seats, not enough books. You come late, you're standing in the back of the room sharing a book. How many of you remember that? Comp competing to get into university, then competing to get into the job force, competing for promotions. You know what, if you're not willing to put in the time, the hours, I got 80 million others that are right behind you willing to do it. And so you get this fiercely competitive, hard driving, hard nosed, hard working generation. Do we have any competitive baby boomers in this room right now? Any competitive baby boomers at all? Yeah, it's usually like a competition to get your hand up first. And so you get a generation that, you know, this is where the, the big goals, the big, vis big, big visions come from. When we look at our CEOs, our baby boomer CEOs, it's like, we can implement all of this. We're going to the moon. And then you have the Xers and the millennials that are like, yeah, right, dude, get real. How many of you heard your, your younger students or your children say, get real, mom, get real, dad? Yes. Now, we see this shift. The 70s then leads into our next generation, Generation X. Where are my Xers at? hey -o. Xers, we think about big influences for this generation, we think about the explosion of the media. By the age of 20, the average Xer had watched 23,000 hours of TV. Whew. I don't know if that's a great stat or if that's a, you know, parental neglect, I don't know how that happened. 23,000 hours of TV and they grew up watching very different TV than baby boomers, you know? The shows aren't I Love Lucy and Leave it to Beaver for this generation. 
And now they're seeing 24-hour news media, but they're also seeing things like MTV. MTV pops up on the scene. How many of you extras remember 24-hour music video marathon sessions? Yes! Yes! What were some of your favorite early music videos? What were they? What do you remember? Duran Duran. Video Van Halen. Video killed the, the radius. Madonna. Any, anybody remember uh, Jenny's phone number? Eight six seven five three zero nine. Yeah, you remember Jenny's phone number from 20 years ago, and you can't remember your kids' cell phone numbers today. <laughs> wow. Now, again, though, it's not only MTV. We see 24-hour news news media pops up. CNN. Now it becomes it's a different kind of news than what baby boomers saw. Baby boomers, you grew up and saw 30 minutes of nightly news brought to you by who? Dan. Walter Cronkite. Leave it to the history teacher right here, thank you. Walter Cronkite. And does anybody remember what Walter, what one of his nicknames or what he was referred to as? He was known as the... He was known as the most trusted man in America. Can you imagine a news person being known as the most trusted person in America today? That shift started with Generation X. Cable, ne cable television, it became a ratings race. Go to air with stories as fast as we can. If it's not true, we'll simply retract them. You know, in Walter's time, it went through 15 checkpoints. If it came out of his mouth, you had a pretty good bet that it was probably the truth. So now not only are extras being hit with mixed messages, is this true, is it not, but they're seeing scandals in every single sector. Lies, breaking stories, politicians, religion, nonprofit, the military, you name the sector. I mean, we had an extra in a focus group say to us, you name the institution and I can name the crime. Totally different shift in mindset. I'll give you a perfect example. Think about how the generations view institutions. Baby boomers, when I say NASA to you, what is the first thing, first memory that pops into your head? NASA, what do you think of? The moon landing. Landing on the moon, which was an incredibly proud, prideful moment for our entire nation, for the whole world. You know, it planted a seed in a whole generation of kids that, that I can do anything. Go into math, engineering, science. We can go to the moon, we can do anything. Xers, when I say NASA to you, what do you think of? <laughs> Challenger explosion. How many of you were in school? They wheeled that TV. Do you remember that far back? They wheeled the TV in on the carts. And you saw that blow up in front of your very eyes. How many of you knew or knew of someone who knew a teacher who had signed up to try to be one of the first civilians to be on that, to be in space? Of course. And then the news reports in the days and the weeks following. Did we know? Could this have been prevented? Did an individual stand up to the institution and say, no, we shouldn't launch? We didn't listen. We didn't hear it. Totally different view of if this can happen to NASA. You know, if we can't trust NASA, who can we trust? And they're also seeing the most sacred institution, the institution of marriage, crumble on the home front as well. The divorce rate tripled during the birth years of Generation X. So you have a whole generation of kids that are coming home to a very different house than baby boomers. Now, they've got the key to the house. They're letting themselves in. They're making their own meals, doing their own homework, navigating that world on their own. Sole survivors. And they also saw their parents give their lives to institutions only to be let go during the massive layoffs of the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And that whole mindset of loyalty to one institution, one company, lifetime employment, totally eroded. And one of the first brands to reach out and talk to extras about what they saw during this period of time was actually Monster with this campaign from the late 90s. When I grew up, on a file all day. I want to claw my way up to middle management. Be replaced on a whim. I want to have a brown nose. I want to be a yes man. Yes woman. Yes sir. Coming sir. Anything for a raise sir. When I grow up. When I grow up. I want to be underappreciated. Be paid less for doing the same job. I want to be forced into early retirement. You should see your faces. You don't know whether to laugh or cry. Really, you know? And it was like, 
What Monster did so well is they reached out and they said, we know what you saw when you were a kid. And we're gonna give you the platform and the tools and the resources to make sure that it never happens to you. That your security is not dependent upon another institution. You can always land on your feet. And so you couple growing up in a home where you know, either mom and dad were divorced or mom worked. You know, you had a working mom. And so you had to come home and you had to navigate your own time and do that. You're independent. And then you graduate into an economy that wasn't great. And you had to figure out how to become more entrepreneurial, leveraging things like Monster. And as a result, you get this much more independent and entrepreneurial generation. Independent and entrepreneurial. Now they took that into the, into the, the, the workplace too. You ask most Xers how they, they like to work or operate or collaborate. Xers are like, tell me what you want, tell me when you want it, tell me where you want it. Now, I'm gonna go away. Hopefully, you're gonna go away <laughs> and I can get the job done. Let, let me do it, independent operators. Yeah, totally. Now, we're going to talk about what happens when my hyper-collaborative generation, let's all do this together, shows up, what it does to the Xers. That's why all this gray hair is already showing up early, right here. Now, because they saw so many institutions called into question, and, and, and 23,000 hours of television, they saw so many commercials, this also became a highly skeptical generation as well. Very skeptical generation. Now, I'll usually have a, a, a skeptical numbers person in my audience who will say, well, I mean, do you have any numbers or statistics or reports on just how skeptical this generation is? Just saying we're skeptical. <laughs> Love skepticals. I say, actually, we did find a great report. This is, this is actually a few years old now, but we found a great report from third millennium. States, extras believe they have a greater chance of seeing a UFO in their lifetime than a social security check. <laughs> Now, like I said, that joke used to kill a few years ago, and now people are like, oh, it's pretty true. <laughs> now, this skepticism has big time implications when we start talking about implementing new technologies. And so, because at the end of the day, we're all fired up, but we all now are responsible to go back and persuade someone to get on board with what you want. You got all, everyone here, I'm thinking about even my generation. You're a millennial, you're here, you're all fired up about what you saw at this conference. And you're gonna go back and you're like, I mean, we gotta do this stuff. There's some unbelievable new whiteboard technology. And you're gonna be selling that to uh, an Xer administrator, principal, superintendent, et cetera. And Xer is like, you know, prove it to me. I mean, if, if, you, if you're gonna make a statement or a suggestion, you know, you gotta give me more than that. I'm not gonna just take your word for it. It's like, trust me, trust me, trust me. This thing's gonna be awesome. It's gonna help us. The kids' scores are gonna prove. They're like, trust you? What do you mean, trust you? You gotta prove it to me. You know how many people you know, said, trust me? Politicians, leaders. This is the generation that grew up and heard, you know, I am not a crook to I did not have sexual relationships with that woman. Dead square in the camera. You have gotta go beyond that. You have gotta be willing to. Prove that. And so what happens is we get met with this extra skepticism and we're like, this generation is so hard to work with. They're so challenging. It's like, I, 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 don't, I, don't, even, I don't even think they like me. It's just like so negative. And it's like, it's not that. We've got to be willing to embrace that skepticism, understand where it comes from, and be willing to prove it. That's on us. You've got to be willing to prove it. It's going to take a little bit more proof with this generation. And as millennials, so often we're just kind of like, why don't you just believe me? It's so funny, I was, before I came, I had interviewed an Xer principal about this and implementing new technology. He gave me this quote. I, I, I couldn't make this stuff up. He said, millennials need to be willing to prove their ideas. I'm going to ask why, and I'm going to push them. They get so upset, they start crying. <laughs> why don't they just prove it? Then they wouldn't have to get so defensive. Because we haven't had that before. You know, and then immediately the collision and the mindset comes into play that they're difficult, not fun, then they don't like me. Here's the truth. And, and I, if you walk away with one thing on extras, it's this. It's not that they don't like you, it's that they don't trust you. <laughs> Some extras that are like, yes, welcome to my life. Not that they don't like you, it's just that they don't trust you. You've got to be willing to embrace that. And if you think about implementation and it's going to take a team, it's going to take a village, 
taking a team and collaborating to implement is going to look a little bit different to Generation X. Like, I don't, we don't need 15 million little get-together group sessions. And we'll arm ourselves and we'll, get, and we'll go implement. I get it. But Xers, what you've got to realize is we've got to understand this next generation, the millennials. And you think about big influences. It's so often people are like, ah, oh, technology, this is the tech generation. Let me tell you, the original tech kids are Generation X, OK? Xers are the original tech kids. They grew up computers coming into the schools, bringing them into the workplace, video game generation. For my generation, it's not that so much technology. It's the World Wide Web and social media. When technology went social, the game was changed forever. It's the social element. It's changed everything. It's changed the way we connect, the way we communicate, the way we collaborate, the way we access information, buy, sell, everything. Every person on this entire planet is a finger, a, a, a touch away. But more than anything else, it changed the rate at which change is happening today. Think about the rate of change, even in your space in the past 20 years. It's, it's mind boggling. And I'll give you a perfect visual example. When I started school on the front end of this generation, Apple Macintosh released one of the first personal computers, the Apple AE7. How many of you had this or maybe you had the Commodore 64? Uh-huh. It's the entire storage, 128 kilobytes. <laughs> Let me put that into perspective. I mean, we have mostly tech people here. You get this. But for those of you that are not, that's the size of a single tweet on Twitter today. <laughs> what the heck were we storing on this computer? <laughs> the only thing I know I was doing on this thing was playing Number Munchers in Oregon Trail. <laughs> the original tech kids. Number Munchers, huh? There's some game-changing software. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, by the time we're graduating from university, that computer had been turned into a cell phone that could download ringtones 10 times the size of that computer. And then four upgrades from there. Every year, new upgrade, new addition, new upgrade, new addition, new upgrade, new addition. This is why we then leave your schools and your universities, and we show up in the workplace, and I hear from, from managers every day, and we're like, <laughs> This laptop is from 2008. I can't work with this thing. <laughs> and they're thinking, you little punk. <laughs> You're lucky to have that computer. But what they don't realize and that you have seen is that we have grown up. Every year was a new upgrade, new edition. If you have a computer that's two years old, it doesn't talk to your printer. So, but there's a little gap, that, uh, we, uh, a mindset of this is an entitled, spoiled generation. Who do they think they are? It's not that. That's the world we lived in. So social media, World Wide Web, part one, part two, different for our generation, was how we experienced violence. Not that every generation didn't have their fair share of violence, but for us, these things now are starting to happen here. Columbine, Virginia Tech, 9-11, the recent events of Sandy Hook now imp impacting this next generation. It's not in some faraway place. And besides changing the perception of safety and, 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 and strangers and those around you, it also impacted us from the standpoint of communication and, and talking. Because as you very well know, as this shift started to take place, and I even witnessed it in my school, finishing up school was, you know, more funding became available for guidance counselors. Guidance counselors came into the schools more and we talked to the kids about what they were experiencing, what they were going through. I mean, I, I will never forget, I came home and to my, my, my dad, and my dad is a hard-charging, hardcore baby boomer. And I said to him, Dad, you know, if you, were, if you were ever getting picked on or bullied or anything like that at school, did you talk to your guidance counselor? He's like, what the hell's a guidance counselor? <laughs> what you call getting picked on, I call it Tuesday. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just giving you an example of a hardcore boomer, what his view was on that. But then we came home. Not only were we discussing the feelings at school with more guidance counselors and teachers, more supportive view, 
But we're starting to talk about everything with our parents, our baby boomer parents. We have this very communicative, collaborative relationship. You've witnessed this. You know, we sat around the dinner table and got to discuss and take a vote as a family as to how I should be punished. <laughs> I grew up in a democracy. How many of you grew up in a dictatorship? <laughs> uh-huh. Not me. We took a vote. We talked about lots of things. Everything under the sun, actually. Nothing was off limits. I mean, for, for many of you other generations, there was a whole laundry list of things that you did not talk about with mom and dad. Right? I see heads nodding. What were some of those things that you did not talk about with your mom and dad at the dinner table? Sex. Look, you can't even talk about them now. <laughs> Sex, drugs, religion, politics, none of that was off limits. We, there was the shift. It was open, you know? And, 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 and when we turned 18, it didn't stop either. I mean, for most of you, the other generations, when you turned 18, your parents met you at the door, and what did they say to you? Adios, amigo. Bye. Best of luck. You're 18. We're proud of you, but you're on your own now. Or they dropped you off at university. Your old man threw the bag out the, out the window and squealed away fast enough. For us, though, that's not how it looks. 18, when you think adulthood begins, we're still connected. You went off to university. How often did you talk to your mom and your dad? You talk to them every day? Oh, the millennial just said that, of course. You... you for the other generation, once a week, once a month, they call, when you needed money, uh-huh. You waited out in the hallway next to the payphone, probably, okay? There's a shift that has occurred. Let me show you what it looks a little bit like now today with when this generation, my generation, when we went off to school, the relationship with mom and dad now. Anytime. I miss having my own room. What do you think? That's a little better. A little better? Yeah. <laughs> this is my boyfriend, Jamie. I don't feel at home here. I feel homesick. How many of you have Skyped with your own children or your grandchildren, FaceTimed? Of, of, of course. You know this. You're seeing this. You're closer to this generation. This is shocking to the other generations in the workplace. Because what happens now is you have this very communicative, collaborative, open, globally diverse, diversity accepting generation. And we think that the workplace is going to look and feel like it did when we were growing up in our schools, our universities, and at home. And we also think that you all grew up like we did. What we don't realize is that is not true. For most of you, you came of age in much more of a traditionalist type model. Of more, it's more of a military background, top down, command and control, where when I say jump, you say, how high? You say jump to my generation, what do we say? Why? Why? Or actually, you know what, I've, I've, I've created this entirely new way of jumping and it's gonna completely revolutionize the way we do things around here. I would love to tell you about it. Let me tell you about this awesome idea. You're thinking, God, oh, you've been here three weeks already and it's driving me nuts. Yeah, it was a, it was a back and forth. And it instantaneously, a mindset creeps in of, who, who is this generation to think they are? Entitled, uh, no work ethic, not willing to pay dues? You've been here like three weeks and you already want to like totally revolutionize our technology here. Like just hang out for a little bit. We come busting in the superintendent's you know, office and we're like, I got all these great new ideas. It's, we're going to totally revolutionize things. Like if you make it past the 90 day mark, that's great. We'll start to have these conversations. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited too. I just, you know. But what you have to understand, because especially we can create collisions when it's like, we don't see 
the institution, the structure of the institution or the organization the same way the other generations do. You think about and you visualize the education system, maybe your district or the school itself, and definitely in the corporate space, the vision that you have in your mind when you think about the structure, it looks probably something very similar to this. Right? So somewhat of an org chart where there is certain information and certain power lies at the top. And you, you, you kind of know that if you've got ideas or you want to communicate, you go to the person right above you and you communicate up and there's a chain of command and there's processes and policies and procedures and you, you totally innately get that. But when my generation, and you have fueled this as teachers, when we come into the workplace, what we see is this. We see a network, an interconnected, living, breathing network. Where is the information? The information is everywhere. Where is the power? The power is everywhere. There's no, if, if someone has an idea that I want to work with, I just go to them. This is mind boggling for executives in the corporate space. So I pull that up from, we will spend a half a day with leaders just helping them get to this right here. This massive disconnect. They see the world on the right, and the new generation comes in seeing the world on the left. They're like, we don't get it. And now they see this and we say, okay, how do you work with this? I'll show the younger generations these images, and I say, you know, when I show you this, what do you think? How does, it, how do you, how does that feel? What's your reaction? And it's always, it's always like, ugh, you know, ugh. It's rules and regulations, and it squashes ideas, and... It doesn't let me have a voice and, you know, they love the idea of this. But then we push them a little bit harder because the reality is that's a little bit naive and short-sighted. There are great reasons for the hierarchy, for the structure. You know, it helps systemize, streamline, helps disseminate information, streamlining decision-making processes, gets things done. We know who to go to for information. There's obvious benefits of the hierarchical structure. But you've got a whole wave of new teachers and, and, and young millennials entering administration that are going to see the world like this. And we've got to get them up to speed and know, okay, they've got to meet you in the middle. But where the hierarchy clearly fails, the modern organization, institution, education, is when it comes to fostering and encouraging creative ideas needed to stay on the cutting edge in the networked world that we live in today. Creativity and pushing that forward. And so we challenge leaders in every sector, how do we find ways to pull and extrapolate the best from both of these? How do you maintain the great things of that hierarchical structure within your organization? And how do you get ways to make the network happen? How do you encourage and, encourage and foster the creative ideas? One of the best places to start is to just get both generations on, other si on either side to see the difference and to see the benefits. My generation, we've got to realize that there, there is a time and a place where we do need rules and regulations, consistency. There's a time when we've got to skip the why and just jump. And we found that the, the young people that understand and can decipher when to push back and say why and when to jump are so often, are more often the ones that get asked for their opinion and those ideas. You know when to jump and when just to skip the why. For the other generations, we've got to figure out how do we create and foster those new ideas. Inviting that voice to the table. So many young people here today are going to go back and bring these ideas of new technology. They've got to sell it. I think one of the best things that you can do for the young people inside your schools and your institutions is to help teach them how to sell their ideas. Help them learn how to sell their ideas. How many of you have seen a young person bring an idea to the table that was a pretty good idea, and it totally falls flat and goes nowhere, not because it wasn't a good idea, purely because how they brought the idea to the table, how they presented it. How many of you have seen that? It was all in the way they came across, and it gets met with total resistance. Lands on deaf ears. And then what does the young person think? No one likes, no one listens to my ideas around here. I don't have a voice. They have no idea that had nothing to do with their idea. It was all about how they, how they brought the idea to the table. 
And again, we've got thousands of people that are leaving this conference, going back to their schools, and are going to be tasked with selling this change. And, and, and Peter talked about this on Wednesday, too, of change, if we're honest with ourselves, is scary. Change is scary. I'm going to be honest. I walked the trade show floor yesterday. I, I consider myself to be pretty tech savvy. I felt scared and overwhelmed. And I thought to myself, if I'm 30 and I'm supposed to be on the cutting edge, how does someone who, who's another 10 or 15 years, 20 years removed from me, how, do, how are they feeling? It is scary. And, and you could say, well, everybody in this room is fired up and excited, and, and we get it. We're, well, the people that you're selling to, that you're going to need to persuade back in your schools, might not be the case. So how do we help? And this is the best tip that was ever given to me from a mentor, is to understand how to sell evolution versus revolution. Evolution versus revolution. Simple and easy. Revolution is when we come back from this conference, and we're like, oh my gosh, man. I came across the most unbelievable whiteboard technology and student response systems. It's going to be awesome. It's going to completely revolutionize the way we teach in the classroom. It's going to make our old technology seem like the Stone Age. What we don't realize is the person that we maybe were all excited about and said that to is the person who was responsible for implementing that latest technology or has the mindset of, you know what? We've done a pretty unbelievable job of changing people's students' lives and teaching them for 30 years. Is you really going to tell me that's the Stone Age? And now it doesn't matter how great that idea was. And we had no idea that we came across that way, that we disrespected the history and the legacy of that individual. That's revolution. Versus coming at it from the standpoint of evolution. Evolution is simply saying, you know what, we came across some really cool technology that I think can build upon what we already have. I think can build upon what you have already put in place, which, is, which has been incredible what you've done with this. Here's how we can, it, it, you're showing respect for what has already been laid. You ease them into it. Peter brought up a, a great point of, of kind of taking a beachhead, pick one thing. One easy thing to get started with. He gave the example of, you know, go from the overhead projector to the PowerPoint. Take one place. That's evolution. That helps to sell and get them on board. And if we do that, we're going to be heard. Those ideas are going to be much more likely to be heard. Now, the last component, and then I'm going to wrap up. To get and persuade these new ideas and to connect with one another is just recognizing how many different channels of communication we have available to us today. It's a little bit overwhelming, and it's easy to have some missteps on this front. And I'll give you a perfect example. I have so many, particularly boomers, who have to understand with boomers, growing up with 80 million others, and they had to become great at interpersonal face-to-face -face skills. This is a generation that can tell you what you had for breakfast on the phone just by listening to your voice. Now, they pick up those fine details. They can see you coming down the hallway. They had asked the question about you know, a yes or a no on a project. I can tell the way you're walking, the answer is no. This is how they've done, they've done business. This is how they've communicated their whole lives. I'll have a boomer executive say to me, why does your generation text or email me when you're five feet away? <laughs> you're right there. Why are you emailing me? Another boomer said, you can email me all day long. I'm going to call you back because I'm a talk to you kind of guy. <laughs> you email me, I'm going to call you back. And I'm like, you call me and leave a message, I'm going to text you back. So we got to get on the same page. <laughs> and that is the truth. Judgments come into play. We're like, this generation is incapable of having face-to-face -face conversations. You default there. I'm like, well, you have to understand, let's not judge that. We have just grown up, as is the generation that you're now educating and raising up, interacting with the screen. And so how many of you remember in the early to mid-90s when we had all sorts of training on computer and email and just general computer lessons to get us up to speed? Huge in the corporate world because it needed to be trained on. Well, now today, we don't need, when, when these kids show up at, at work, they don't need training on email or the computer. What do they need training on? Face to face. Because we haven't done it. And so let's not judge it. Let's just say that's now what the need is. 
And so this is a place where you can help the corporate world is in that face-to-face. -face. But in your working relationships, what I want you to walk away remembering is this. It's all about communication flexibility. I am always asking now, how do people want to be communicated with? And this is your rule. At the end of the day, you are responsible for learning how to communicate in the style the generation you're trying to reach is comfortable with. You're responsible. And when I say you're, I, I'm squarely pointing the finger at me and my generation. If I go back and I'm going to try to persuade my baby boomer superintendent on a new piece of technology, it does not serve me if I know he's a talk to guy to write a really persuasive email and big long report or text him while I'm here. I need to go down and have a face to face conversation. I have to be adaptable in my style as well. We have to meet in the middle. At the end of the day, as you think about the generations, we have to step back and recognize that it's not about who's right or wrong, better or worse. It's about celebrating these differences taking the time to understand the history and where that person comes from so that we can all be flexible. The only way we're going to pull off all of this amazing new technology that is changing the face of education that you are in the heart of is if we do it together. We have to do it together. And I will leave you on a closing note with one of my, my favorite videos from two of my favorite people, from Bob Dylan and Will I Am. May we all stay forever young. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. And may you stay forever young. May you stay forever young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May your hands always be busy. May your feet always be swift And may you have a strong foundation When the winds of change is shift And may your heart always be joyful And may your song always be sung May you stay forever young May you stay forever young Every generation refreshes the world Cool. Thanks for a great, great morning, everybody. Safe travels home. Thank you, Seth. Thank you for helping us to understand each other better. I want to thank you for attending and making the commitment to expand technology to your classrooms to enrich student learning opportunities. We have had a stellar turnout with more than 8,000 in attendance this year. Thank you, steering committee. Thank you, board, and thank you, staff, for a great conference. And at this time, please welcome Merritt Threadgill, Vice President-Elect Convention, to the stage. Well, are you ready to get inspired? TCA 2014 is all about geeking out over learning new ideas and technologies, envisioning new possibilities, and then translating that energy into real results with your students and our peers. TCA 2014 will motivate you to make changes that address old challenges and give you the tools you need to transform education one student at a time. One of my favorite quotes by T.S. Eliot sums it up great. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Get your geek on. It's hip to be square.
We'll see you there. So I know you all have your cell phones. I want you to get them out. Go to your calendar and go ahead and, and, and just mark it down on your calendar. February 3rd through the 7th, 2014. Be prepared to get inspired. Thank you. On behalf of ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, you are invited to attend ISTE 2013 from June 23rd through the 26th in San Antonio. TCEA members are eligible for special pricing until May 1st. Check out the TCEA or the ISTE website for details. TCEA is committed to bringing you more opportunities to convene and learn. This summer, TCEA will again host TOTS and Technology Summer Conference in Galveston on June 9 through 11. You are invited to join us for three days of high quality, exciting, content specific professional development dedicated to pre-K through fifth grade. Indulge in exciting educational technology integration tools, best practices, and collaborative learning opportunities. Registration is open now. This fall, the second annual Systems Administrator Conference will be held in Dallas. Check it out on the TCEA website for more information about both of these events. I look forward to seeing you there. At this time, I adjourn the annual meeting of the membership. And now, once again, for the last time, your favorite thing, please welcome to the stage TCEA Door Prize Chairs, Holly Squared, Holly Davis and Holly Wharton. How many golfers do we have in the house? All right, well our first door prize we're gonna get started with is from All Texas, it's a Callaway golf bag and inside it's full of all kinds of goodies, some Callaway golf balls and tees, all kinds of things. And our first winner is Renee Rivas Rice from Colleen. And I swear she won a door prize the other night. Is she here? From Summon Integration, we have a Dewey document camera stand for an iPad. I'm sorry, there's no iPad included though, so I hope you have one. Oh, Melissa Martinez from South San ISD. From Lakeshore Learning, we have 10 interact interactive software tiles, class pack license for up to five computers in language, art, science, and math. And the winner goes to Kevin Fox from Colleen. Boy, it's Colleen's lucky day, isn't it? From Safari Montage, we got those great Starbucks gift cards, and we've got four of them, so we're gonna give them away really quick. Lisa Noe from Centerville. Lori Dubrava from Tolosa Midway. Jessica White from Colleen. Wow. Mona Effler from Kilgore. That's all four of them, right? Mona, did you come? Oh, there she is, she's coming. From Study Sync, we have an online learning tool designed to raise the level of reading and writing for all learners. Today's door prize is a one year teacher subscription to Study Sync's digital library, and it goes to Richard Cartwright. Richard, are you here? Yes, he is. Okay, you gotta holler and yell out. From Read Naturally, we have a gift voucher for up to $300 for Christy Stewart. From eBackpack, we have a 14-month teacher subscription for Mindy Albert from Richardson. Our next two are from Capstone. It's $100 off your next ebook order, and you get five of each. Brooke Dimsdale from Southwest Christian. And Sarah Anderson from Bryan ISD. Sarah? 
Did Sarah already leave? Sarah going once? Okay, Sarah, we're gonna give that away to someone else. How about, Re oh wait a minute, how did you do that? You must be present to win? Okay, how about Reginald Dodd from Caddo Teacher Technology Center? There we go. From Explore Learning, we have a math and science gizmo for Natalie Brewster from Corpus Christi. Also from Explore Learning, we have a Reflex three-month teacher license for Christina Gramillion from Cattle Parish. Christina. Oh, there she is. She's coming. Okay. <laughs> Here's a card that says, pick me, pick me, pick me. And it actually got pulled. <laughs> from Academic Superstore, the pick me goes to, it's a Corral Painter 12, and it's for, there is a name on the other side, Mari Lyles from Texas School for the Deaf. And I hope that this is Atomic Learning's last black t-shirt to give away. They've got to be running out soon. But they also give a six-month subscription to their product, and it's awesome. Nancy Morris from Wills Point. How about a Kindle Fire HD? From Peak Up Time, and the winner is Teresa Delgadillo from Southside ISD. There we go, she's here. From Visions, we have a book called Google Tools for Teaching and Learning, and the winner is Tom Walter from Tulsa Midway. From Ellie Lance, we have this cool looking watch down here. For Shelly Payne from Centerville. From our, one of our wonderful exhibitors who we can't call out their name because of those funny little E-rate laws. We have an iPad and we love them for this. Julie Williams, oh my gosh, from Centerville. Oh, look at this one. She calls these ones with character. From Brother International, we have a compact speakerphone for Aaron Sebesta from Needville. From SMK, we have a Link Air Mouse Elite and Low Profile Keyboard. And the winner is Tammy Harris from ARF ISD. From Responsive Services International, a Logitech Mobile Boombox. Kimberly Vento, Broken Arrow Public Schools. That's from Oklahoma. Oklahoma in the house. From Calphone International. Oh, these are our favorite little, what are they? Pandas, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. For Joanna Moreland from Navasoto. Yay! Jesus, God. Okay, we have a couple of door prizes that are on the end in the back. And they are have to do with technology. There's some remote control cars. <laughs> They're really pretty cool. One's a car and one is, take a look at it real quick. A helicopter, I believe you wants a helicopter. So we'll give one away and you get, don't forget to give the controller on the top. How about to Jill Hinton from Roxton? There she is. And the second one goes to Anna, Yabara from West, is it West Laco? West Laco. West Laco. Is she here, Anna? Oh, she's here, okay, there we go. Okay, we got two more. This one's a pretty good one, y'all. It's a 32 seat NXT student response system from Turning Technologies in the bag, ready to go for Julie Overpeck from Midway. Look at, okay, you've got to act, you, come on, you got to, yay. Okay, here we go. It is Friday. And our last door prize, I hope you didn't fly because it's in this big old box at the end. It is a all-in-one touchscreen monitor from Bytespeed. It's 21 and a half inches and the box is pretty heavy. And the winner is Belinda Maldonado from Lorena ISD. I think she's here. Ladies and gentlemen, please have a safe trip home, and we will see you next year for TCEA.